Uh, thanks for joining us. And um, today we're going to talk to you about the the report reordering Ranganathan, uh, shifting user behavior, shifting priorities. And um, I I thought that that it would be really good to give background about why we decided to look at Ranganathan, and basically. We started thinking about the user behavior research activity that we've developed within OCLC research. And we've done some very interesting work uh, looking at different types of individuals and how they get their information. They may be users of libraries and they may not be users of libraries. But we, were, we looked at what they're doing, how they're getting information, who they're contacting, and what's, what other services, online systems they're using, and how they actually uh, feel about uh, using library sources. We also looked at data reuse and researchers. And we were trying to think of a way that we could pull all of this together under one framework to have it make sense, and then to also pull together many of the reports, uh, public articles, presentations we've given, and come up with some recommendations or ways of thinking about the library services and the people who we want to use them. I hate to say non-users. Uh, my colleague, Mary Radford, and I have been talking about uh, prospective users, which I think is much more positive saying those who don't use libraries. So we decided, we started thinking about Ranganathan and the five laws of uh, library science and how um, there was literature out there in the 90s and actually there was one new article um, published uh, talking about Ranganathan's laws as we were completing this report. And so people have been revisiting these laws, but no in the context of uh, all of the laws together. Many were looking at individual laws. Uh, we know that we're moving from an era of this content scarcity where the library used to be the only place in town to get information or one of the only places to a multitude of opportunities, channels, contributors of information and sources. I'm sorry, I see that some of you are having trouble hearing me. Uh, will you please let us know in chat if if you can hear me? Uh, and I will try to, um, is that, that okay? Thank you. Someone said that's better. Sorry, everyone. I want to be sure that this, this is working. And so as we looked at these laws, we, we also thought that they should be reordered in today's information environment. And, and We've reordered them. And number one, we've put as save the time of the reader. And this is a blast uh, from the past for many of you from uh, library and information science graduate school. But that was law number four. I, I won't uh, give you a quiz on this. The second law, every person his or her book, uh, means the second law. Books are for use was Rang and Nathan's first law. Uh, we've uh, put it into the, the third. Uh, every book its reader was Ranganathan's third law, which became our fourth. The library is a growing organism was number five with Ranganathan. We've kept it in that position, but as you can see in the table, that, the, uh, that library is a growing organism overlays every, all the other laws. Because that, I think that's just a given. Uh, many things just do not change. As you can see on the right side of this chart, we have our interpretations. And so that's what Michelle and I will, will talk a bit about today and hopefully come up with some recommendations, suggestions for some things we as librarians can do. Um, Ed, we were looking at reflecting on these laws. We're not trying to support them. Um, we're looking at them in a way to um, actually look at what's happening today with our users. 
I want to talk a little bit about that. We're not showing this graph or table, but there's a table in the report on page four. And in the table, it actually um, talks about some of the things we've learned about users in our various studies. And in that, we've mentioned things like eBooks or iTunes or Google or Google Maps or every um, – we, we may have listed um, other things that are from a commercial side. What we're not saying that um, – and we're not promoting such services. What we're saying is – that individuals have told us, we have learned, that these are the things that they are using. These are the services that they go to. And we as librarians must be very, very aware of where individuals are getting their information. I'm not saying that we're going to compete with these. What we're saying is awareness is very, very important, and we can also – um, available in some of these same spaces. So if you're looking at the report, please keep this in mind. And as you read the report, you will um, understand that we are not promoting such uh, things. So back to the laws. Save the time of the reader. That was Rangan and Nathan. And we're coming back with embed library systems, and services into users' existing workflows. Um, again, this is based on the user studies that we've done and uh, the studies that others have done. In this report, we've uh, identified our research, but we've also identified the research of others. It is not exhaustive. It is not inclusive. Um, that would have probably taken us um, another 50 years but we tried to bring together some of the highlights. Uh, this law, Save the Time of the Reader, or embedding library systems and services into users' existing workflows, we feel is one of the most important laws. Going back to that, um, the multitude of information that's available, the multitude of providers of these information services, also, the scarcity of time and lack of attention. Uh, we hear that every day. Um, I, I can't, I'm, and I'm sure all of you feel this and hear it. You'll be sitting in meetings and someone will say, I don't have time to do that. Or it's one more thing to add to the list. And what we've learned with our studies and our conversations with individuals is that convenience is a primary factor ending and choosing information. And convenience, we must understand, is dependent upon the situation that the individuals find themselves in at the time when they need information, and also the context of the situation. And so that changes. That's a moving target. And that's another thing that we must think about. And so we need to consider how to save users more time in more places and in ways that are familiar and convenient to them because we've also learned that, that um, familiarity to them is, equates with convenience. This is a quote from Ranganathan uh, from the original uh, His Five Laws of Library Science. And he's talking about studying the consequences of this law uh, with his fourth law and our first, and he is saying, you know, maybe we should just follow the reader or the individual, if you want to say, um, from the moment he or she enters the library uh, until the moment he or she leaves. And I think that is so relevant because we talk about library assessment, um, so the assessment of our services, our systems, we also talk about evaluation a lot in libraries. And when we're thinking about individuals who use the library, we need to think about following them and seeing how they use our services or how and why they use or don't use our services. 
And this also go back, I mean, in many ways, you know, Rang and Nathan may be doing ethnographic studies at the time. And this law of save the time of the reader, we've pulled out some other subcategories. And so we're looking at uh, time as time. And, and as I've already said, and as we all know, people are inundated with information uh, that they need to read, review, evaluate. Um, they have many choices. Uh, we've also learned that people skim, um, chunk out information, squirrel away information, and operating within these time constraints. And uh, we've also learned that um, individuals will weigh the consequences. So if you're talking to a student, the students say, well, this assignment is only worth 10% of my overall grade. I'm not going to put a lot of emphasis on this. I'm going to just get by with what I can. And so what is enough? They're satisfying. Um, we've, um, with some research that Michelle has done, uh, she learned that the earthquake engineering researchers delay contributing data to their central repositories um, because of the, the, the whole process of uploading and documenting the data were so time and labor intensive. And so they would just say, I'm going to delay this and hope, you know, I'll have to get to it someday, but that's not a, a priority. Again, back to convenience. And, and we are not saying this about libraries or about search engines. This is what we've learned from individuals who we've talked to. And I should say that we've talked to thousands of individuals from 2003 into the present. We've asked some of the same questions over that time period, even though we've done, had different research questions, um, different purposes for the, the research. And we've learned that often people are frustrated with libraries. Um, they avoid in-person visits, although they like the face-to-face -face the best. Uh, why? They talk about limited hours in libraries, travel distances, simple things like parking. Um, if, if parking is difficult, it's an inconvenience to me. Um, the time needed to go into the library and to maybe figure out the library. We've heard from faculty, um, and a quote was, I'm smart. But yet when I go into the library, I can't figure out what I'm doing. The signage is bad. I don't understand the words. What was convenient to many people? Search engines. Why? They're fast. They're easy. To them, they're simple. They're cost effective and readily available from a mobile phone, from a tablet, from a laptop. And we, we hear more and more. We've also looked at time as a user experience. And with this, it's all about discovery. And web searching has driven higher expectations for our online library catalogs. And individuals want, you know, again, quick, convenient, familiar. When we've also talked to them, they talk about ratings and reviews and rankings by relevance. Um, on the side here, we this is very familiar to all of you, Amazon. We've heard many people reference Amazon. Why can't the library catalog resemble Amazon? Give me some previews of what I'm looking at. Give me ratings, of, but I want ratings and reviews of people like me. Um, I just read a study uh, that, uh, a report, a, um, a research project that OCLC has funded through the OCLC Elise program. And what found uh, was, and Sunny Kim was um, one of the researchers, and what was found was that undergraduates said they wanted reviews for their everyday life from people like them, their peers. They wanted reviews and ratings for their academic purposes of older people. Um, and so, again, older, wiser people. 
this is a quote from Neruzzi, and this was in an article published. And it says um, a webmaster should basically think about users, how to attract them, um, develop for them, cater to them. And, uh, again, this was in reference to library systems. And I think one of the things we, we also need to think about when reexamining our services and systems in, in libraries is think about how we market and promote these services and systems. Uh, what we also learn from individuals is, is they don't know what we offer. When we talk to individuals about re virtual reference services, many of them had no idea that this even existed and don't understand our terminology. So the way we may list things on our websites or in our catalogs may not be understandable to them. Um, we also have to provide this broad range of tools, which is fortunate for us because it goes back to, to one size uh, fits none. And that, you know, depending upon this context, this situation, I need specific types of services. We've learned that individuals who are sitting in the library are often the individuals using virtual reference services. Why? Because it's more convenient than standing up, leaving a chair, and asking a question face to face. I think what we really need to, to do is be more proactive. So think about what individuals are doing now, but try to um, envision how we can go beyond that and so that we're not behind the times. We um, need, need to be very proactive and respond to the challenges that, and, that we see across our communities. This, this requires taking risks and sometimes taking risks and offering services or systems that aren't ac actually hit, but that's okay. It's okay to fail um, because then we've tried and we've learned what does not work. This is um, the next law, every person his or her book. And this is our second law. And what we are proposing is know your community and its needs. And so connecting every user with the content or the information that they need, um, there's no value in saving the time of the reader if we can't pinpoint the information that they need or if that information is not easily accessible to them. And so that's another thing that we need to think about. I alluded to the fact that, and as we all know, there's been this rise in, of e-content e -content that's made available. And when we look at the second law, and this is a quote from Clune and Dove from 2005 when they talked about Ranganathan's second law, um, it, it demands that we, in quote, eliminate obstacles that prevent users from making effective use of electronic resources. And so it's coming down to this seamless integration, this, okay, we discover it, now we can seamlessly access it. Um, we really need to also think about locally produced e-content because this is getting much more attention and we want to share this with others. And so we need to think about how we can get our locally produced e-content out there, our special collections content, our research data. Um, that's another very important area that these have increased in priority and demand. And these are challenges for us. We um, have some uh, statistics, and these came from a study that was done um, at OCLC and by um, Kathy DeRosa and a group of individuals in 2005. And we know that 90% of the respondents described search engines as um, perfect or good fits for their lifestyle, but only 49% of them did so um, for uh, library uh, for the library, and even fewer for the online library. So again, we're falling behind in, in this area. Uh, I research data, and it's a 
a great example um, of utilizing e-content and promoting the library. Um, Estelle has been leading a project, and I have been a part of that, um, looking at uh, librarians and data management. And what learned is librarians have been uh, very optimistic. Uh, they see that um, there's uncertainty in this area, but that they have great opportunities here for developing personal relationships with researchers, um, providing these services to faculty and, and students. Uh, also, they see that it's fun, interesting, rewarding, and it's a great way for us to not reinvent ourselves, but, but create a, a, a new way of uh, providing a service. Research indicates that, as I said before, that people are more familiar with search engines than with the libraries. Um, I think there was a, another study done in 2014, and it's in the GIST Quick Guide. Based, GIST is based in the UK. And um, it says that Google is the main starting point for a wide range of users. And we found that in our research as well. Uh, we also have some statistics from uh, some uh, from the uh, user uh, the predictions of library study with DeRosa 2005 that 36% of the survey respondents reported they were extremely familiar with search engines. 26% reported being very familiar with libraries, and 20% reported they had never heard of online libraries. So these are things that, that we need to think about, and I think it goes back to promotion. And uh, I'll leave my section uh, with this quote, and it came from a, a, a project that we have done with JISC, and again, the UK, and looking at multiple user behavior studies. And what we've learned is that there are many different groups in the research community, um, that the language spoken is not shared by the different disciplines. Um, they have very different ideals. They have different ways of sharing, different perceptions of sharing. So I think what it comes down to, again, and back to that quote with Ranganathan of following the user, is getting to know your community, uh, doing outreach, uh, doing um, some analyses of your communities, user studies, and developing co collaborative uh, work relationships. A thing to look at are some of our analytics, all of the data that we collect that also can help us understand our users and our community. Michelle, I'm going to turn this over to you now. Let's start with <clears throat> our interpretation of the law books are for use, which is on developing the physical and technical infrastructure to deliver materials and services. This attention on infrastructure because libraries have had to rethink and expand it to connect with the users, whether it's in the building or on the internet. Uh, in this chapter, we discuss some of the opportunities and challenges related to that. So interestingly, part of the challenge is that books are still the brand. So when it comes, when people about libraries, they think about books. And sometimes they do that to the exclusion of other things. So this quote from the project that Lynn talked about that I'm leading, looking at academic library engagement in e-research and data services. This is helping researchers manage, share, and preserve, reuse each other's research data and other scholarly outputs. A federal funding agency mandates changes to technology and changes to scholarship. And so one of the biggest challenges with faculty researchers mentioned in this study is they don't see the library as a partner in this space. It's about the library as a place to go for help with these kinds of research needs. This director is quoted here talking about how to get past those perceptions. She goes to say and talk about the different kinds of things that they that have and they they um, preserve, hey, we had scrolls too. 
all different kinds of things. So now it's data in a spreadsheet or whatever. Her point really doesn't matter whether we can handle it. But she was getting past some of those perceptions, which is going to take some doing. Nathan stressed improvements uh, such as library location and hours, as well as space, furniture, staff education, and training, because these would improve access. So brands also must actively manage engagement as well as access in virtual as well as face-to-face -face environments. So with physical space, we're seeing things like configurations with fewer stacks and more room for people. We talk about the learning commons to support class exchanges group or social constructions of learning. We can think about maker spaces where students build and craft with electronics or 3D printers, uh, do embroidery, welding, or sculpting in places like the University of Nevada in Reno or Wheaton College. We're all seeing space being designed to accommodate change um, even over the course of a semester. If we, about contempor if we think about temporary reconfigurations of space to engage stressed students Places like J. Murray Atkins Library at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. The goal is to support changing users' needs, but it's also to paint a different picture of the library and librarians in some sense. Um, these are not typical activities associated with the library, and, and they're trying to break the mold. The goal is at work with the technical infrastructure, but it's not without its challenges. Um, users not recognizing that. Some of the online services they tell you are actually courtesy of the library, things like LexisNexis or PubMed or Medline. On the limited use and adoption of some library systems and services, uh, whether it's for social, organizational, or technical reasons, um, sometimes there's a poor understanding of users' needs and motivations and their incentives. We've seen this with the wave of institutional repositories built with researchers which share and reuse each other's data more e easily. And in the first years, they remained practically empty, whether limited or poor tools and technical support or lack of time and funding to get things prepared for deposit or fear of being scooped or not getting credit. Um, sometimes there were legal and ethical constraints. So what about um, a word here and suggestions about how to address some of these things? Things. Um, I took this quote from uh, Hebert and Theralt, and it's based on their discussion of supporting students uh, at the end of the semester. And it right on, and if we think about it, it can be extended to the community when we think about community access. Uh, their words outline the goal, really. So the question is, how can that be achieved? And we, we kind of see that um, being achieved in doing several things that, that might help. Um, to achieve that. And so I'll focus on two uh, today. Uh, one kind of meets with what Lynn was talking about in terms of knowing your community, but understanding and internal, internalizing user interests. Um, with having them participate directly in the development and changes to the physical and technical infrastructure, whether it's at the beginning of design or negotiating changes over time. It's helping them at their point of need. Um, whether it's installing pop chat services when a search turns up empty or roaming the library and, and helping those who need it at that time. It's demonstrating the value of the library and librarians in the context of um, grouping and the results that students get from it. It might be showing what the library brings to teaching and learning beyond these popular alternatives, how it as a complement. For librarians, it may be about bringing expertise to across a range of activities, um, so their expertise can be really identified and internalized and viewed as flexible and adaptable. Books beyond online journals. So the next one, increasing the discoverability, access, and use of resources within users' existing workflows. This interpretation of every book its reader. We our interpretation with the three broad trends in an attempt to understand and address how to get relevant authoritative content into the hands of users. So the understanding the flow and workflow, understanding the what, who, the how, 
out of a search, what we describe as the points in the workflow. Relationship to one another, but it also how they're changing. Tip brands have bridged the gap by connecting users' requirements to available resources, and they still do. But often than not, users also have the tools and technologies to address their own needs, which may not lead to library materials. What's required now in some cases is this new kind of mediation that allows materials to be found through additional sources beyond the library. For instance, several libraries have increased discovery of their collections by adding links to Wikipedia, uh, including Ball State University Libraries and the University of Washington Libraries. Um, in the Ball State study, one year after linking 40 digital assets from the Hague Sheet Music Collection, the study reports the number of web pages via Wikipedia during a one-year period after these assets were linked was over times greater than the total number of page views via any source one year prior to linking. Second is acknowledging the role of online social interaction. Information seekers also rely heavily on it to connect to what they need in terms of both the discovery of the content as well as the evaluation of the content. The information seeker wants to know what peers and colleagues and bosses value because they're an important part of their life. So in many cases, they are perceived as the experts in the area. So connections and social influence are not necessarily new. In an online environment, it makes for a wider, more efficient dissemination. Things more readily quantified. Ratings from a number of people can be at or average. They're more permanent. They stick around. These things that make online social interaction a medium that we need to pay attention to. Is uh, context the need more attention to it? It's really about providing enough context within users' workflows to enable decision making, especially when there's such a number of resources and information services available. So, this online library catalog should operate more like search engines, but that's really only part of the solution. Um, information seeking study of students and researchers that was funded by JISC, William and his colleagues concluded that being able to operate a search engine does not mean that one is able to find the good quality information necessary to help us learn and to advance our society. And users can't always discern whether the content that rises to the top of the search engine result relevant and trustworthy enough to meet their needs. This is where they're at an advantage and act as what Rangan Nathan called canvassing agents. Uh, ability to select relevant, credible material, and in some cases provide that additional contextual information. So when we think about recommendations or suggestions for ways forward, again, um, we're going to rank an in this quote, where he talks about the public being continually surprised by what the library has to offer in terms of service and interest and comment of, I didn't know you had, and all of you can probably fill in the blank with something you've heard from uh, your community. And this quote, because it still speaks to what lives are challenged by today, and that's the free access and use of their materials, but perhaps for reasons that are entirely different than in the 30s. I to say, um, and this is relates to what Lynn talked earlier, the public reaction this, this kind I didn't know you had or, or surprised by makes it evident that publicity is necessary for the pub for the library, as is for the commercial firm. See that it can be thought of of different term in different terms. So there's the traditional marketing and social networking, but there's also partnerships and also redundancy. So using discovery through partnerships is more points through which library content can intersect with users' preferred workflows. In order to increase discoverability in more workflows, we can start developing new partnerships with, say, technical companies to expose data, or professional academic societies to understand researchers' needs and challenges better, or offering library resources to a better community outside of the local or the regional area, beyond the traditional user groups. 
increasing access through redundancy. It's about providing materials in multiple formats through multiple channels, providing resources online as a library in a physical environment, making online library catalog tab tablet and mobile friendly, letting users know about the alternatives to libraries offerings, and letting users look for resources in a variety of places, and making those overlaps as well as those complements known. And also about increasing use through marketing and social networking, which are familiar. We're seeing library librarians do more of this more frequently. I'm going a step beyond that and not think to engage the public in providing context and explaining the modern and current relevance of an item from a special collection, rather than merely showing it, telling the story, getting them hooked. In. So it is a growing organism. We we are no reinterpretation. Uh, and we've tried to demonstrate that, I think, in the preceding chapters of the book, and hopefully this came through in our presentation as well. We do, though, what it means for libraries to grow in today's uh, rich, uh, time-poor environment. Nathan considered the collection, staff infrastructure, and use parts of the library cap capable of growth. And we will consider the growth and change in these four factors and propose a fourth uh, attention. So about the collection. The growth of the collection is, is related to electronic materials, digitization efforts, and now research data. If we add to that, all of the content easily available on the web, by comparison, the question is how does the library grab, grab user's attention? In terms of staff, have been focused on doing more with less. Running the number of staff positions, they've been repurposing staff. We've seen the trend most recently in their offerings of new services, like research data services. But again, how do librarians convince users that they're up for all of these new challenges, that they can help? Uh, structure I've also discussed a bit, and the growth in it isn't just a reflection of the volume of the content. It's in whatever resources are necessary to meet service demands, whether it's spaces, maker spaces, or repressing space for the end of the semester. The goal is to get users in the door and to let them, let them know what else the library has to offer. When it comes to patron use, um, another study um, that talks about patron use and talks about the need for it to extend beyond numbers and size to incorporate complexities relating to diverse users' needs and wants. And we've discussed this as a where librarians can focus their efforts and have real impact. So do we see this other area that we want to grow, share of attention, or that users spend on library-related services and materials? We it in three ways. So just thinking about and specifying the ways that libraries are and want to be relevant. Second is raising the visibility of libraries and library resources. And raising awareness of the unique capabilities of librarians, what they are that cannot be provided by anyone else. It's just the specific materials librarians are able to access and manage and preserve over time. It's really broader than that. It's their ability to apply expertise and resources in ways that fill knowledge gaps. So it says change is constant, and we just learn to deal with it. It's remember that you are a service industry. It's about being, thinking, continuing to think about users, always thinking about users, keeping them at the top of mind. So I begin to think about elevating libraries and librarians' relevant visibility and unique capability size of users. Well, for instance, one way is to think about measuring the ways the library intersects with, resembles, and complements outside services. Think of improving library services, but also leveraging the strengths of the non library services. Um, understanding users in terms of their current tool use and the breadth of tools and technologies they use. 
and examining this in a real world environment, not librarians' experiences with these tools, there's actual experiences with them. It's thinking about and measuring the ways users find out and learn about the library and library services. Users' most used services are good ways to get from Google or Facebook or Wikipedia to the library services. Users to most used services. Also teach them how to better use the services they prefer. Maybe and how the library complements them. Also, to other libraries, the collective library brand improves by promoting the services and resources other libraries make available. The unique capabilities determining what librarians can offer that are hard to come by anywhere else. What their expertise that can be applied across a variety of services. The key is also showcasing those and explicitly matching those to community needs. Another serving the community, both the physical and virtual environment. You know, the online search places don't offer this. And it's, it's that ability to kind of exist in both worlds and that ability to um, cross materials and services available in both environments to pull people in. So I start, um, and, and I close in the same way that we closed in the in the publication, and that's really ending with two quotes from Albert Einstein, because his words really reflect the experiences that and I had together in working on uh, this book. Work the five laws over the past eighteen months or so has really influenced our thoughts about our work and librarians and libraries. It's helped to begin to think about how to better combine our areas of interest and expertise as we move into the future. This is from Alice in Wonderland. So as many of us have an idea about where we want the library to go from here. Um, relevance came up a lot in the project that I'm working on around e-research and data. But it's come up in all in different kinds of new service offerings as well that as libraries contemplate those. <clears throat> we believe in order to do that, maintain librarians have to develop relationships with existing as well as prospective users of library services and programs. Our Obje objective in undertaking this project was really to consider today's information environment, how and librarians are contributing to it, and what can be done to enlarge their footprint. Rankin's laws helped us do that. They're helpful today as they were in the 30s. They kept us focused on the core values of librarianship. And hopeful publication and presentation demonstrate the respect that we hold for his work as well as his laws. Um, prior to going to questions, I just wanted to acknowledge the folks who have helped us get here today and get this report complete um, in terms of their insightful contributions, valuable feedback, research support, thought comments, and work design and layout expertise. I'd also like to thank the funders of the projects that and all the work that went into this report. Um, I left JISC and NSF, as well as our collaborators at various universities and institutions. As you see, there's a list of references <clears throat> um, that I'm paging through now um, to get to see if there are questions that people might have at the time. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. If any of you have questions, please feel free to submit them via We'd really appreciate it if you'd change the send to drop down to all attendees so everyone can see your question. Um, we do have a question from Lillian Lang Phillips, and it is Lynn mentioned the reinventing of librarians in terms of support and contributions. So we look at the role and identity of librarian with the core philosophical framework and value system in terms of the purpose of librarianship, the relevance of Nathan's laws, then do you think our role and identity has changed in that respect?
I have to mute myself. Can you hear me? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, um, that's a good question. Um, I think what we have to do, you know, and I go back to this, it used to be that people came to us, to the librarians, to the library, uh, because there weren't a lot of other options, and to their distracted because there are a lot of other options. So I think that our core views and and what we stand for are the same and and, and basically the same as these five laws um, inter- that we've interpreted of Rangan Ethan's. However, I think we have to go about our day-to-day business, so to speak, or work um, in a different way. And I think we have to be more exposed, both um, physically, so face-to-face, and more exposed in the virtual environment so that individuals who are there can find us. And I, and I, I think you know, promoting what we do, we didn't have to do a lot of that, and now we do. I also think we have to really concentrate on this assessment, evaluation, of services, and, and I think that's not different from what Rangan Nathan was saying when he was talking about following the user through the library. Uh, now, today, we have a lot of different data points, so we can follow the user through the library physically. We can follow through um, the library and how they get information virtually online. Uh, we can ask them questions face-to-face or in surveys. Uh, you know, we can do a lot of different things, and so I think that basically uh, we have to just change the way we um, present ourselves. We have to almost um, be much more obvious and more conspicuous than we used to be just because we're vying for uh, attention. So you want to add to that? Um, I just to say that I, I, I think in, in a career as a librarian as well as careers in other professions, it's about kind of keeping abreast of what's going on externally that kind of that affects you as well as things that are happening internally. And I think within the in this in, in this day and age, as you said, there's a lot going on. And I and I think as with any career, you know, keep what's core. Cool there are changes that happen externally and internally that you have to be aware of and respond to. Thank you. Um, There aren't any other questions at this time, but we still have a few minutes. So if you do have any questions or comments, um, feel to submit them. Um, Apologies, there was a little glitch where it wasn't letting uh, participants send messages to everyone. I'm going to forward a couple here. We do have a question from John Costa Rico, and it is here. I'll paste it for everyone. Would you expect libraries to disappear altogether as physical collections, and would librarians disappear as well? Actually, evolve into something else, some other information, professional occupation. What would be the new concept? Um, I think we're evolving now. Uh, I've been involved in in some work in with the um, European universities and um, librarians, and we're looking at a, a call from the European Union, and it's on educating. They were calling them either data uh, information scientists or data librarians, and uh, so I think we are evolving. And um, I, I don't think libraries will disappear. I mean, who knows? I don't think libraries will disappear altogether because I think if we create this community that it will exist both online and physically. Um, I think the library has evolved as a place, uh, and you see that in some public libraries and communities. Uh, I know um, in, in my community, one of the public library branches is in the um, in 
in the community recreation center. And, you know, that library didn't used to be well used, and now it's one of the most used libraries around. Uh, I think that in the academic environment, we may see the librarians, information professionals uh, being housed, and we see this today, uh, being housed in the academic department, being a part of the classes. I talked to a librarian at a conference who said she's attending um, the classes in, in an undergraduate program, and the students think she's a student. Um, she said she doesn't hide who she is, but um, you know she works with them, helps them. So I think you know we we have to evolve, and I think that's what um, Michelle was saying about all professions. And I think we will change, but and and I know what will be called. I I think we'll be still doing um, the thing that we do now. And that's providing these services, helping get um, authoritative information, uh, an answering questions. Uh, I think that's that's what we'll be doing. Michelle, I, I agree with you. I think the other thing is that it has evolved in terms of the staff being more diverse to meet different needs. So it's just as we talked about, just the physical infrastructure, it's the virtual infrastructure, which means that you now need to bring in people that have that technical background to support to support that kind of infrastructure. If we're bringing in things like makerspaces, it's about um, having people that can help support that. So I think there is um, a higher more diverse body of people, which bring in new ideas and new solutions, but it's also keep it, having that foundation of skills and and find ways to um, um, use the new ways and perhaps doing some reskilling. And I think that's what you're kind of alluding to when you talk about some of the data scientists and folks for data librarians. It's in some cases they're being reskilled. In some cases, um, you know, universities and colleges across the U.S. and Europe are providing new kinds of programmatic activities for folks to come out. Um, with those kinds of skills as well. So I think it's it's an evolution. I don't think it's necessary that um, there's going to be a disappearance and a diversification of just the kinds of people that are in the library. So, uh, we have another question from Mark Estes. So all librarians and special librarians can be embedded with their users, but how can public librarians embed themselves with their users? Uh, Hi, Mark. This is a blast from the past. Um, I think I, I gave an example of this. I think there's several ways. Um, one example is being a part of this um, the the community recreation center. The other, um, I wrote a chapter in a book um, edited by Joe James, Library 2020, and in talk about. Um, uh, being in uh, Aspen in the summer or even in the winter, and I was walking around the town, and there's an information booth right there in the center of town. And so I went over and actually used this information booth, and then I started questioning whether the you know who was who was sitting at the in this booth, and it wasn't the library. And then one of my friends who lives in Aspen. And was was saying things about well the library wants money to to you know in to expand or to remodel said you know no one uses the library anymore and he was going on and on and and I thought you know one way for that library to embed itself in the community would to be sitting at one of those information booths and you know have um Woody or help or ask me or and then have your little branding there. And so I think there are opportunities, and, and, and it doesn't have to be a community like Aspen. It can be any community. I was in Washington, D.C., and there were individuals walking with yellow shirts saying, um, I think it said information. And, and so I walked up and started talking to the person, and then I asked, are you with the public library? And she said, no, it's a, um, we're with um, the city and we want to help people if they need things within their, you know, the community or to find things. And and I thought, wow, what a great opportunity for a library. So I think there are ways to do that. Do you have other ideas? 
I know that that was perfect. Well, thank you, Lynn and Michelle, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, that, that last question that's come through, and we're right about at the top of the hour. So um, if you think of any additional questions after the webinar, feel free to reach out to Lynn and Michelle directly. We've just pasted their email addresses in there, and they're also on the slides. We will post a recording of this webinar online shortly, as well as the slides, and we'll know as soon as those are available. Um, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.